Michael Jackson's purchase of the Beatles sent shockwaves to both the public and studio execs, who were astonished at the sound business sense of the once Peter Pan of pop. Jackson had a special place in the industry, having started in the 1960s he was well aware from a young age on the harsh reality that black artists would commonly be cheated out of their recognition not to mention compensation for their impact in the industry. Obvious examples of this was the popularization of rock and roll, with its immediate roots in the African-American jazz, gospel, country and R&B sound, it had been watered down for the safer consumption for white audiences. This charge was led by famous white singers who usually cover songs by black artists and given to heavier push white artists, who had the backing of large record companies. The whitewashing of rock and roll was a major issue in the late 50s and 60s. On August 13, 1952 in Los Angeles, California, Willie May, Big Mama, Thornton recorded, Hound Dog, a 12-note blues song that would make an undeniable mark on music history. It was released a year later in February of 1953. The song would go on to spend 14 weeks on the R&B charts, becoming Thornton's only hit record. Hound Dog is listed as one of the 500 songs that shaped rock and roll by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In 1956 Elvis Presley recorded his own version of the song. It blew up becoming one of the best-selling singles of all time. Over 10 million copies were sold. It held the position of number one on the pop, country, and R&B charts for 11 weeks, all at the same damn time. It was a record that took 36 years to break. Hound Dog is just one song of many that was originally recorded by black artists, re-recorded, repackaged, and arguably made safer, more sterile, by white artists, to wide commercial and critical acclaim. Little Richard, one of the founders of rock and roll, a musical genre that was quickly absorbed and commercialized by white bands, recorded and released Tutti Frutti in 1955. The song helped form the burgeoning genre and was archived into the Library of Congress National Recording Registry. Pat Boone did a cover of the song, a version that took it down multiple notches, making it sterile and safe for the consumption of white teenagers. The cover peaked higher on the charts than the original. Little Richard would sue him in 1959 for back royalties but settled out of court for $11,000, left wildly undercompensated for his work which left him broken financially as well as emotionally. These stories are endless. And a young Jackson who looked up to these black stars, including Richard, Jackie Wilson, and James Brown, took not only creative pointers from the artist but looked at them as business cautionary tales. James Brown said it best by stating, black recording artists were all too often welcome in the show, but not the show business. Not wanting to be under-celebrated and cheated out of his publishing, only to be left for broke at the end of his life, Jackson yearned to take control of his career and business. After the success of his Off the Wall and Thriller albums, respectively which were two of the best-selling album, the latter becoming the best-selling album of all time. 1981, Michael Jackson collaborated with Paul McCartney, writing and recording several songs together. Jackson stayed at the home of McCartney and his wife Linda during the recording sessions, becoming friendly with both. One evening while at the dining table, McCartney brought out a thick, bound notebook displaying all the songs to which he owned the publishing rights. Jackson grew more excited as he examined the pages. He inquired about how to buy songs and how the songs were used. McCartney explained that music publishing was a lucrative part of the music business. Jackson replied by telling McCartney that he would buy the Beatles songs one day. McCartney laughed, saying, great, good joke. Jackson took the advice of the former Beatle and had begun acquiring the publishing of songs that truly meant something to him. Over time Jackson began to acquire anything he could get his hands on. As 1984 rolled around, Jackson had pushed the idea of publishing to the back and focused more on the Jackson's victory tour. That was until, September of 1984 that Jackson would first be informed that the ATV catalog was up for sale by his attorney, John Branca, who had put together Jackson's earlier catalog acquisitions. Yeah, Mike the Beatles, Branca exclaimed. 
In response Jackson did a full turn, juked in the air, and shrieked, I want it please. Warned of the competition he would face in buying such popular songs, Jackson remained resolute in his decision to purchase them. Branca approached McCartney's attorney to query whether the Beatle was planning to bid. The attorney stated he wasn't, it was too pricey. According to Bert Reuter, who negotiated the sale of ATV music for Holmes A Court, we had given Paul McCartney first right of refusal, but Paul didn't want it at that time. Lennon's widow, Yoko Ono had been contacted as well but also did not enter bidding. The competitors in the 1984 sale of ATV Music included Charles Koppelman and Marty Bandier's New York-based The Entertainment Company, Virgin Records, New York real estate tycoon Samuel J. Lefrak, and financier Charles Knapp. On November 20, 1984, Jackson sent a bid of $46 million to Holmes A. Court. Branca suggested the amount of the bid after having spent time evaluating the earnings of the catalog and learning of another bid for $39 million. Jackson was only interested in the music copyrights, but the package also included buildings, a recording studio and studio equipment. The two sides signed a non-binding memorandum of mutual interest in December 1984 and Jackson's team began a four-month process of verifying ATV Music's legal documents, financial reports, and every significant composition in the nearly 4,000-song catalog. The two sides began drafting contracts in January 1985 and follow-through meetings began on March 16. Jackson's team described the negotiations as frustrating, with frequent shifts of position by the seller. One Holmes A. Court representative described the negotiations as a game of poker. Jackson's team thought they had reached a deal several times, but new bidders would enter the picture, or they would encounter new areas of debate. The prospective deal went through eight drafts. In May 1985, Jackson's team walked away from negotiations after having spent hundreds of hours and over $1 million. In June 1985, they learned Koppelman Bandier had made a tentative agreement with Holmes A. Court to buy the catalog for $50 million. That in early August, Holmes A. Court contacted Jackson and talks resumed. Jackson raised his bid to $47.5 million, but he had the advantage of being able to close the deal faster, having completed due diligence of ATV Music prior to any formal agreement. He also agreed to visit Australia as a guest of Holmes A. Court and appear on the Channel 7 Perth Telethon. Holmes A. Court included some more assets and agreed to establish a scholarship in Jackson's name at a U.S. university. Branca closed the deal and purchased ATV Music on Jackson's behalf for $47.5 million on August 10, 1985. Reactions to the acquisition and Jackson, the once Peter Pan of Pop's savvy business sense was shocking to the public. But not to those who knew Jackson, Frank DeLeo, Jackson's manager at the time, had long been impressed by Jackson's sound business sense. A lot of artists don't want to know anything about business affairs, but Michael is involved in every facet of his career. He's not one of those people who stops thinking when he walks out of the recording studio or off the stage. Jackson went on to use the Beatles songs in numerous commercials, feeling that it would enable a new generation of fans to enjoy the music. McCartney, who had used the Buddy Holly song catalog in commercials, felt saddened. Privately, Jackson was reported to have expressed exasperation at McCartney's attitude, he felt that the musician should have paid for the songs he had written. At the time, McCartney was one of the richest entertainers in the world, with a net worth of $560 million and a royalty income of $41 million. Jackson stated, if he didn't want to invest $47.5 million in his own songs, then he shouldn't come crying to me now. Appearing on The Late Show with David Letterman shortly after Jackson died in 2009, McCartney spoke about Jackson's acquisition of the Beatles' songs and the impact of it on their relationship. And which was, you know, that was cool, somebody had to get it, I suppose. What happened actually was then I started to ring him up. I thought, okay, here's the guy historically placed to give Lennon McCartney a good deal at last. Cuz we got signed when we were 21 or something in a back alley in Liverpool. 
and the deal, it's remained the same, even though we made this company the most famous, hugely successful. So, I kept thinking, it was time for a raise. Well, you would, you know. David Letterman. Yes, I think so. And so, it was great. But I did talk to him about it. But he kind of blanked me on it. He kept saying, that's just business Paul. You know. So, yeah it is, and waited for a reply. But we never kind of got to it. And I thought, em. So, we kind of drifted apart. It was no big bust up. We kind of drifted apart after that. But he was a lovely man, massively talented, and we miss him. Ono was pleased that Jackson had acquired Northern Songs and called it a blessing. Speaking in November 1990, Ono stated, Businessmen who aren't artists themselves wouldn't have the consideration Michael has. He loves the songs. He's very caring. She added that if she and McCartney were to own the songs, there would certainly be arguments. Ono explained that neither she nor McCartney needed that. If Paul got the songs, people would have said, Paul finally got John. And if I got them, they'd say, oh, the dragon lady strikes again. At least one Beatles song was covered by Jackson after acquiring publishing rights, Come Together, from the album Abbey Road, primarily a Lennon composition, in 1986. The song was recorded for Jackson's 1987 album Bad but was scrapped and instead put on history, past, present and future, book one eight years later. It was featured on the 1988 movie Moonwalker and also had an official video. It is not known if Jackson covered any other songs, as no bootlegs have been released. In 1995, Sony offered Jackson $110 million for a 50% stake in a combined ATV and Sony Music Publishing joint venture. Faced with financial issues since the 1993 allegations, a deal was sealed by Jackson during a concert in Tokyo following hurriedly arranged meetings and disagreements over the selling price. Jackson had essentially sold half ownership of the Beatles and other songs for a large profit. Jackson's own songs, grouped in the My Jack catalog, were not included in the deal. The new company was named Sony ATV Music Publishing and became the second largest music publisher in the world. Michael P. Schulhoff, president and CEO of Sony Corporation of America, welcomed the merger and praised Jackson for his efforts in the venture. In 2006, following the financially crippling trial of 2005, Sony gained operational control of Sony ATV and obtained an option to buy half of Jackson's stake in the company at any time for a fixed price of $250 million. Throughout the rest of the 2000s Sony ATV would acquire a slew of publishing of country songs and the songs of artists like Eminem, Akon, and Shakira. After Jackson's death in 2009 it was revealed that he had plans to gift Little Richard back his publishing. Here the will, um, John Branca, went to Little Richard, sat down with him and said, Little Richard, you've been so important in our lives, uh, so important to music, we would like to give you your catalog back. And at the time it was, it was easily worth four to five million dollars of annual income every year coming through. And Little Richard was so touched by that, he told us yesterday that um, it, it, mat it meant so much to him. Um, ultimately, they couldn't work out the deal, but he, he said it was not Michael's fault, it was working with the Sony side and some other pieces. But the, the gesture showed the humanitarian side of, of Michael Jackson that, you know, a lot of people may not, may not know about. Rumors also began that Jackson's will had transferred Tay Beatles' catalog back to Paul, but nothing materialized of it. In September 2016, Sony acquired the Jackson Estate's stake in Sony ATV in a deal valued at around $750 million. The Jackson Estate retained a 10% stake in Emmy Music Publishing, and its ownership of My Jack Music, which holds the rights to Michael Jackson's songs and master recordings. The revenue will be placed in trust for Jackson's children. In January 2017, McCartney filed a suit in United States District Court against Sony ATV Music Publishing seeking to reclaim ownership of his share of the Lennon-McCartney song catalog beginning in 2018. Under U.S. copyright law, for works published before 1978, the author can reclaim copyrights assigned to a publisher after 56 years. McCartney and Sony agreed to a confidential settlement in June of 2017.